At Mercy Village Church, we are loving, abiding, and going. That's how we state our core values concisely. But each of those three core values is stated in its own robust sentence that gets at the fuller meaning. So in this sermon series titled Roots and Fruits, we're examining each of our core values and the why and the what behind each one. This content comes from Mercy Village Church in Barbersville, West Virginia, and you can learn more at www.mercyvillage.church. Uh, for thousands of years, uh, the Jewish people have prayed a prayer morning, evening, and before bed three times a day. Uh, we don't know for certain what Daniel prayed. If you remember the story of Daniel in the lion's den, but uh, he goes three times a day, go, prays in the direction of Jerusalem. That's the law that is made against that, that that he then breaks because he's remaining faithful to God instead of instead of man, and he's thrown into the lion's den. But it has been a tradition for thousands of years to pray what's called the Shema. The Shema is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. And that's where we're going to go today. Now, we are going to learn a little Hebrew today, but that doesn't mean that I'm a smart person or that I know Hebrew. Um, in fact, I'll share with you some videos that I watched this week from the Bible Project. If you're familiar with the Bible Project, uh, maybe you have seen the work that they've done uh, on the Shema and the Hebrew words that make up the Shema. It's incredible, an incredible opportunity uh, to learn exactly what is meant in that prayer. I'll share those, try to share those links out through our social media and our email this week. But as we move from the root of our first core value to the fruit of our first core value, the place that we will turn is the Shema. And then for obvious reasons, as you'll see, the very first core value that we have is that we are loved by God. That's the root. We talked about that last week. And the fruit for our first core value is twofold. All the other ones is just one. For this one, it's two. We are loved by God. And we will love God fully and we will love others selflessly. So the result of God's love for us is that it then pours out in our love for God and our love for others. And so today we're going to talk about how we are called to love God fully. But to do this, we must be rooted in God's love for us. First John 4.19 we love because he first loved us. So even this call originates with God. This call of the Shema, this call of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, is rooted in the fact that God loves us. But what we'll see today is that God is both supreme and he is supremely worthy of all our love. God is both supreme and he is supremely worthy of all our love. God is above all things and of all things, he is the utmost worthy of our love. So, Father, today, what we know not, please teach us. What we are not, please make us. And what we have not, please give us by your grace. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 6 Verses four and five. Jesus quotes these in his high priestly uh, before he's crucified. Uh, several times in the New Testament you find these quoted, but this is where they originate from. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. That is the Shema. The word Shema means hear, listen. And that's why this is called the Shema, because the very first word in Hebrew is Shema. Here, listen up, pay attention. And so that's where it begins. Shema, O Israel. And it can mean to hear with your ears, of course. Proverbs 20, verse 12 uses this word. Ears that Shema, ears that hear and eyes that see the Lord has made them both. And so the sound waves, hearing sound waves come into your ear, that's Shema. 
But it's more than that. Uh, in fact, I'll quote from one of the videos that the Bible Project put out about the Shema. They say, but if you look at the other ways that Hebrew authors can use the word Shema, they use it to mean more than just let sound waves enter your ear. In Hebrew, Shema can also mean pay attention or to focus on. Remember Leah, right? Jacob, so Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob uh, works for Laban for seven years to marry his daughter Rachel. But Laban pulls the switcheroo and, of course, uh, gives him Leah instead of Rachel. And his response is much like the one we just heard from the hallway. But he then works seven more years to, uh, to have Rachel as his wife. But if you're familiar with the, the recounting of these events, Jacob loves Rachel more than Leah. Leah is, is actually feels hated and completely unloved by her husband. And she has her first son and she names him Reuben. And then she has her second son. And look at this. She conceived again and bore a son. And she said, because the Lord has Shema heard me, like sound waves have entered into the ears of God. He has, has heard me. Uh, that I am hated, he has given me this son, and she called his name Shem'on. See the difference? See the see the similarity there, which is Simeon, which means God hears, and he doesn't just hear; he responds. So it comes with this idea of focusing on and paying attention. But it gets even better if you go to uh, Psalm twenty-seven seven. You see another example: Shema. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You'll see this all through the Psalms, this word, this Hebrew word, Shema. Now, when the psalmist says, Shema, hear, O Lord, and then makes his his prayer to the Lord, he's not simply just wanting God to hear him or just regard him. He's wanting God to respond to him, to help him, to bring him up from the pit or to deliver him from his enemies, etc., etc., and so the word carries with it the idea of acting and responding. In fact, that's how God will use it with his people. If you remember when the Israelites come to Mount Sinai the very first time, at first, God's going to deliver all the stuff that he says to Moses. He's going to deliver it directly to the people. But in that first scene, as he booms out in this loud voice of thunder from Mount Sinai, saying what we're about to read, the Israelites kind of lose their, lose their guts to, to hear him. And they say, Moses, why don't you go up and talk to him? This is kind of scary. But what he says when all of Israel is still listening to him directly is he says, now, if you will, Shema, Shema, repeat it, carefully listen to me and keep my covenant. You will be my own possession out of all the peoples. Now here's the point. Listening and keeping the covenant are closely related for, for, for God. Shema and Shema, get this, are the same word in Hebrew that they are for listen and obey. Same word. There's not two words for listen and obey in the ancient Hebrew language. There's only one. Shema and Shema. To listen is to obey. To obey is to listen. When God calls us to hear, O Israel, calls us to hear, O Mercy Village Church, he's saying not just let the sound waves come into your ears. Not just pay close attention, but also respond to the words that I am saying. In fact, if you have a, an ESV or an NASB or another translation i quoted the csb intentionally here it actually is translated obey in different versions of this passage and so that's shema the idea of not just listening but doing listening and doing two sides of the same command shema so with that in mind the question is listen to what right like if if that word carries so much weight and it does of listening and intentionally engaging and responding, then what is so important that we must hear? And the command is to love God. To love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. There's two things there. One, God is supreme. And two, He is supremely worthy of our love. And so He goes through three words here. The first is heart. 
Love God with all your heart. The word is levav. I learned that this week. You could easily have learned that before I did. But the word is interesting. It's sometimes translated mind, not just heart. Like when we think of heart, we think of affections, maybe uh, even the organ of the heart. But for the ancient Hebrew, it was way more than that. The ancient Hebrews had no word for brain, nor even a concept of the organ of the brain. But they did have a concept of the heart, that there was a heart inside the chest, like an organ inside the chest of a person that if it stopped, they would die. In fact, uh, I forget which king it was uh, in uh, maybe in Judges. It talks about him actually having a heart attack. They know about the heart, but not the brain. And so things that have to do with the intellect are attributed to the heart so often in Scripture. You'll see them say that with the heart, with the levav, you discern. With the heart, you understand. With the heart, you keep wisdom. That's why this word is often translated heart and often translated mind. It carries with it all of that. The word heart comes first in this list because for the ancient Hebrew, that word levav would have represented the very epicenter of who you are as a person. Physical life came from the heart. Affections, feelings came from the heart. Intellect and understanding came from the heart. It was all wrapped up in the heart. And so at the core, the epicenter of who you are as a person, living, thinking, and loving would be your heart. Love God from the core of who you are. This is why Jeremiah will say, guard your heart for from it comes all of life. Your heart, in ancient Hebrew, this word levav is the very epicenter of who you are. So love God with your heart. Love him with your soul. This word is nefesh. Again, I may be butchering these words. That's fine. We'll all pretend like that's how they're said. Thank you for uh, uh, that. But there's a twist here, too, because when we think of soul, we often think of that more emotionally. More like, oh, that guy's got soul, right? Like he feels it. And that's part of it, but that's not all of it. It's not soul like we tend to think of it. It's a word that's far more associated with the throat. So if you were to see this word nefesh, if you could read Hebrew, which I can't, and probably most of us can't, you would find it in a lot of places in the Old Testament to refer to the actual word throat, nefesh. The idea being, though, that everything that comes into your body and goes out of your body that's necessary for life has to pass through the throat. You'll also see the word nefesh used to describe people, living people. Abraham has 33 nefesh, family members, 33 people in his family. In the Torah, a murderer is a nefesh slayer. In the Torah, a kidnapper is a nefesh thief, someone who takes a person. The psalmist, when he says, if if you remember this song that we used to sing at church camps and stuff like that, as the deer pants for the water, so my nefesh, not my soul per se, but all of me thirst for you, my nefesh thirst for the living God. It's beyond just feelings and emotions. It's the entirety of who you are. If levav, if if the word for heart is the epicenter of who you are, then nefesh, the word for soul, is all that you are. From the inside, the levav, out. The nefesh of who you are. So if levav... Of course, is the epicenter and nefesh is all of you, your throat, your mouth, your arms, your legs, your skin, your gender, your hair, your eyes, every single imago day bearing uh, cell of your self is for loving God. Every bit of you from your fingernails to your toenails to the, well, the ends of your hair, if you have it, it's for loving God. And more than that, it's not just about your physical body. It's about the what and the when and the where of who you are. 
It's everything about you, the place you find yourself, the talents that you have, the, 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 um, the resources that you have. You see how when you understand it, right? Like I'm not going to Hebrew to sound smart. I'm going to Hebrew so that we can feel the weight of the Shema, the weight of this command to love God. Love him with the center of who you are and love him with everything that you are. All, every bit of you. And the last word is might. And this is the word ma'od. This word is frequently used as an adverb. Now, I don't even know what an adverb is because I was homeschooled. But it's added to a verb to make it even stronger. For instance, when God says creation is very good, remember that? He's saying that it is mayod good. Very good. When the flood, uh, when Noah's flood is said to have grown extremely powerful, that's the same word, mayod, powerful extremely powerful it's actually an idea of anything and everything that you can have or be or do to its fullest extent it's this accentuating word it's it's taking everything to its highest level to its fullest your core and all that you are and all that is yours is for loving god to the maximum level to the furthest extent. The word ma'od, this is also from the Bible Project, doesn't limit the number of ways you can show love for God, just the opposite. The point is that everything in a person's life, every moment, every opportunity, every ability, and every capacity offers a chance to love and honor the one who made you. It's a call to love God with all of your muchness. I love that with all of your muchness to love God. This is the command that is spoken to our hearts in Deuteronomy chapter six, verses four and five. Everything that you are from the very core of your being to the tips of your fingers, your bank account, your address, your job, everything that makes up you is for loving God, not just a little bit, but with all that you are. That's heavy. If if that was it, that would leave us all saying, that's impossible, I can't do it, I quit. Before we even try, I quit. I can't love God like that for three hours, let alone my entire life. But verse 6 tells us that this command is not just spoken to us, but it is written on the hearts of God's children. And that's good news. Deuteronomy 6, 6. But these words that I command you today will not just be in your ears, but they will be in your heart. Same word, levav. You guessed it. That the very core of who you are as a child of God will have written on to it the command to love God with all that you are. This looks forward to the new covenant, by the way. And I'm just going to fly over this because we've already got a lot of information rattling around here. And I, and I don't want to get out in front of our skis. But, but the idea is that this command would be spoken to all of Israel, but not all of Israel would have it written on their hearts. Those who had faith in a future Messiah would have it written on their hearts. Just like all of us now who have faith looking back at the sacrifice uh, in the past of the Messiah have have it written on our hearts. All those before the cross who looked forward to God keeping his promise to send a Messiah would have it written on their hearts. But it would be spoken to everyone. It would be taught, as we'll see here in a second, to everyone. But one day it would become more distinct And this would be referred to as the new covenant when there would be a huge amount of Gentiles who would begin to, through faith, believe in the finished work of Jesus on the cross and be saved. Well, at the very same time, there would be very many Jewish people who would reject 
the Messiah. And at that point, what would take shape uh, from a blimp view perspective is that God was saving people through faith, not through ethnicity. God was saving people through faith, not through ethnicity. Jeremiah prophesied of this. He said, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with you, the house of Israel, after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. And I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God. And they will be my people. And no longer shall each uh, one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me. For the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more. But Jeremiah wasn't the first to say this. Moses said the same thing before he died. He said it like this. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring. So that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. And the Lord your God will put all these curses on your foes and enemies who persecuted you. And you shall again obey the voice of the Lord and keep all his commandments that I commanded you today. Here's the point. Child of God, you are a new person. Right. And so the command to love God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength is not a command to do something you can't do. It's a a command to do something that God has transformed you into being able to do. I'll go even further. If you're a child of God here today to walk in step with loving God is to be who you are. And to walk out of step with loving God is to be who you no longer are. God's asking you not to be somebody different, but he's asking you to be who he's made you to be when he calls you to love him with everything that you have. That's really what sin is, quite frankly. Sin is us walking out of step with who we are. It's us living differently than our identity has called us to live. So God has hardwired you If you are a child of God, to love him. God commands us to love God and God transforms us into people who love God. He doesn't leave it up to our own strength and our own power to do it. He empowers us to do it. One last question, though, and and we're we're here. Maybe you're asking this question or maybe you've had this question asked to you and and you need equipped to answer it. Or maybe you already have all the answers and you can just be reminded of them today. But what if someone says, well, well, how can you command love? How can God say love me? Right. Like, isn't that the opposite of love? Isn't love something that's a response and a feeling? But yet he says, do it. Love me. He commands it. Well, again, that has to do with our messed up definition of what love is. If love's just a feeling, a whim that you fall in and out of, then that's a silly command. But if love is an action verb, if love is something we do, if love is a choice that we are making, if love is actions that we are taking, then of course it can be commanded. But the follow-up question, and I've heard this before if you never have, then isn't God still just an egomaniac that he would command us to love him like that? And here's the best answer that I've I've heard to that question. John Piper was the first I heard do it, but he wasn't the first to say it. The idea is not original to him. But if I came in here this morning and I said, behold, my beauty. First of all, that would be funny. But if I said, behold, my beauty, look at me, you should look to me and desire me. And in me, you will find all of your happiness and joy and satisfaction. There are many of you who could testify wrong. That's not true. So that would be evil. That would be egotistical. That would be sinful. First, because it's a lie. Second, because I would actually be distracting you from the one who can do that for you. Instead of pointing to Jesus, I would be pointing to myself and that would be evil. But if God himself were to walk in here today and he were to say to you, look at me, behold my divine beauty and in me, 
in loving me find all your satisfaction and joy and happiness? That would be righteous. One, because it's true. That's where you will find the deepest joy and satisfaction. The only place you'll find the deepest joy and satisfaction. And two, he's not distracting you from the source of joy and happiness. He's directing you to the source of joy and happiness. So when God says, look at me, it's actually righteous, not evil. It's the furthest thing from evil. What would be evil of God is if he asked you to look at anyone else but him to find your joy and satisfaction and happiness. And so God, in his goodness, in his love for us, commands us to love him and loves an action verb. And so that's the Shema. And the Shema is all about hearing and not just hearing, but obeying. And love is not just about feeling, but it is about doing. And he transforms us. And so the last eight verses go fast because they're just application. Two main applications that we see. First, verses 7 through 9. You shall teach them these commands, this command to love God. You shall teach them diligently to your children. And shall uh, talk of them when you sit in your, in your house. And when you walk by the way. And when you lie down and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and you shall uh, they shall be the frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. The first application is remind one another of the command to love God. We must be reminding one another of this command lest we forget. Reminding is rhythmic. Something that you're always doing, reminding. There's a lot here that we could go into detail about, but we won't. About the frontlets and then the, the, the ways that the, the Israelites would very literally, like even sometimes take the Shema and, and uh, wear it on their head and they would have it on the doorpost of their doors. But the idea is that when you're going and coming and staying and leaving and sitting and standing and walking and running and working and playing... On and on the list could go. Remind one another. Generationally remind one another to love God. So for you in your context, wherever you find yourself daily and weekly and, and monthly, how are you reminding yourself and how are you reminding one another to love God? With all of your levav, all of your nefesh, all of your mayo. Being here is one of the ways that we do that. We're together. Being reminded of this. It's rhythmic. We do this every Sunday. It's a rhythm. It's a reminding rhythm. That we are to love God. Mentoring people. Discipling people. Being discipled yourself. Being mentored yourself. Encouraging others testifying of the truth of God being brought to bear in your life to one another are all ways that we remind one another to love God. And it's not just with the people in this room. It can be with our co-workers, with our families, with our classmates, uh, siblings, neighbors, but certainly with the people here in our church family. What rhythms are you putting in place? At home? at work, uh, here amongst the body of Christ? What rhythms are you putting in place? Reading the Bible together, praying together, sharing life together, worshiping together? And if you're not, how are you going to start? Right. That's the, the, the outworking of the command to love God is that we would remind one another to do it. That's the very first application that Moses gives. Or that God gives to Moses and Moses gives to the people. you got to remind each other of it. The second one sounds redundant, but it's not. It's just slightly different. The other is remember together. The first is remind one another of the command to love God. The other is remember together the command to love God. And, and when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you, with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat 
and are full, then take care, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Two situations that we need to remember when we're in. So listen, this is one way I think about it. Reminding is rhythmic, almost preemptive. It's these basic rhythms of life that we have. Remembering is situational. When you find yourself in certain situations, remember the uh, command to love God. Remember the truths of Scripture. Situation one, when we need to remember, is when entitlement threatens to cause forgetfulness. You see, he's saying you're going to have all this stuff that you didn't build and and houses you didn't fill and and cisterns that you didn't dig. You're going to have all this stuff that you had absolutely nothing to do with. But what happens with all of us, if we're honest, and may we be honest, is we grow entitled. We think, I deserve this. I earned this. I made this happen. And when we don't have the things that we think we should have, we feel entitled. Why do I not have it? I've earned better than what I have right now. I deserve better than what I have right now. When situations that made you desperate for God turn into situations that are full of the blessings of God, you must remember or you will grow entitled. You must remember or you will grow entitled. So when you see entitlement sneaking up on you, remember you were made to love God. Not to get cisterns full of water. Not to get houses full of stuff. That's not what you were made for. You weren't made for a huge bankroll. You weren't made to get any of those things. Nor do you deserve any of those things. Nor do I deserve any of those things. You were made to love God. Remember that. Situation number two and the last one. When idolatry threatens to cause us to go after lesser things. He says it is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the people who are around you. You're going to see other people worshiping other things, loving other things, going after other things. And you, he says, the people of God must remember to love God. We don't build idols We don't carve idols out of stone in our society, but we still idolize thousands of different things. Some of them are shiny and need uh, tune up every month at the at the auto shop. Some of them um, are uh, include balls that get thrown around or shot into hoops or some of them have to do with achievements in the work that we're in. Some of them have to do with comforts that we want to surround ourselves with. You get the point. Things that we attach our heart to at a higher level than we attach it to God. When we love other things more than God. And when that happens, remember. Remember the command to love God with all that you are. Remember that God has written that on your heart. It is actually who you are. What you were made to do is love God from the core of who you are to the, to the uh, wholeness of of who you are. That's what we must do. Same spiritual disciplines that you use to remind yourself will be ways that you remember. Those same things. Reading the scriptures. Praying. Being together in community. Those are all things we do. The legalistic nature, by the way, if you grew up like me in, in a really conservative kind of legalistic church, you see all those spiritual disciplines. It's like a checklist. I got to do this and then that's going to make God love me. Or I got to do this and it'll prove that I'm an actual, actually a good Christian. And no, 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 that's an undersell. That's a huge undersell. Those are actually the action side of loving God. That's what it is. It's doing what you were made to do. Reading your Bible, praying, being around the people of God, the disciplines of of the Christian walk. There's another path. That's our last verse. For the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God, lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you and he destroy you from off the face of the earth. That pathway is not recommended. That's the pathway of choosing to embrace entitlement, choosing to embrace idolatry, Instead of reminding yourself and remembering to love God with all that you are. To love God more than your own life is to love your own life more than you ever did before. And to go down another path of not loving God is a pathway. 
to destruction. So the good news is the grace of God. Good news for us today is that God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When God chose Abraham, he was a pagan star worshiper who remained a liar. Jacob as well. On and on you could go through all the heroes of Scripture, all called to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, all going after other things, all falling short, all failing to live up to it. But God's love trumps your lack of love. God's love trumps my lack of love. It doesn't change the command to love God. It doesn't change the direction that we are supposed to go, but it trumps it when we fail. So, if you're here today and you're failing to love God, who among us isn't, to love God with every single ounce of who you are, fear not. God's love for you predates your love for Him. And God's love for you will continue through any lack of you loving him. And he proved that on the cross. And not only that, but if you hope to love God, you cannot do it apart from his love coming first. God loved us so much, famous verse, that he gave his only son. His love came first. Jesus' death came first. His finished work on the cross came first. And our response is faith in what Christ has done on the cross. And that faith brings us into relationship with God, into the family of God, and then God writes on our hearts. He changes our DNA, the core of who we are, and He makes us people designed for loving God with all that we are. Might we walk faithfully in that. So remind each other of that, remind me of that, remind your family of that, remind your friends of that, remind your mentor, people you're mentoring or discipling of that, that that's what we're made for, that that's what we're called to, loving God. And when things get hard, when sin creeps in and and threatens to steal our affections away from God, when suffering threatens to steal our affections away from God, it's time to remember. Remind yourself through rhythms and remember in the difficult times to love God. Remember that God is both supreme and He is supremely worthy of our love. So let us love Him together with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our might. This is how we're meant to live. Father, you are you are worthy of a significantly better sermon than that. You're worthy of a significantly better sermon than any of us could preach except for Jesus himself. And in Jesus, we see the sermon that we truly need. What it's like to to love with the core of who you are, not just God, but others, all the children of God and to give your very life, Jesus, so that we might find forgiveness and be brought into the family of God. And so as we prepare to turn to communion, yet another rhythm of reminding, reminding ourselves that God's love for us is so rich and so big and the transformative power of of the love of Jesus on our lives has rewritten our DNA. And now we are people called to love you, God, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. May it be so. May it be true of us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening. And if you haven't already, we would love for you to join the work of God as Jesus builds Mercy Village Church. You can learn more at our website at www.mercyvillage.church.